We are in our Foundations of uh, Faith series. We've talked about God's sovereignty, the supremacy of Christ, the Holy Spirit's work. Um, we've talked about salvation. Now this morning we're going to be looking at uh, baptism. So you're going to want to find your way to Acts chapter 10 verses 44 through 48. I just want to give you a lot of runway. So when we go to take off in that scripture, you're there. So there are Bibles in front of you. Um, if you don't have a Bible, our, those are our gifts to you. If your Bible is screaming for your name because you left it in the car or it's on your coffee table, then don't take that. Is it thievery? It's gray area. We don't know. So I just say, but those are around, able to be used um, for you to do that. But we're going to be in Acts chapter 10 um, as we talk about um, the foundations of faith and specifically looking at baptism. You know what? Let's uh, pray before we go any further. God, we, we love the celebration of baptism. We love um, what it means and what it represents. And uh, Lord, we pray that this time is just um, just honorable and glorious to you. Um, that it will draw people closer, that encourage and inspire and motivate others um, to to be saved and baptized if they are saved and, and for some reason not baptized that they would do that um, as well. Um, so Lord, for your glory, um, for your gain, uh, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's always a good opportunity and always a good idea to celebrate God's goodness anytime that you get a chance. Always a good idea. And in fact, I would say the converse, the vice versa of it is also true. It is a bad idea to, to not celebrate and to take advantage of an opportunity that God gives us. Um, for instance, when you're thinking about, since we're talking about baptism um, and we look into this, what do you remember about your baptism? So those of you that are here today that are saved by grace through faith, through Christ alone. What do you remember about your baptism? Who was there? Was the water freezing because the pastor was grumpy? Um, do, who helped to do that? Did you go through the motivations in those things? I mean, I, I remember my first ba baptism. I was, um, man, I was at, the, at the, the small little home church in this town I grew up in Trenton, Ohio. And, and she, you know what? This is going to be even better. Let's look at a picture of me at my first baptism and only baptism. So um, before the internet, before hashtag internet remembers everything, there was hashtag mom keeps every photo ever taken of you. So I don't know how my mom figured out I was doing baptism this morning, but she sent me this picture. Um, I know it's a little hard to see. Um, let's just say what everyone's already thinking. Handsome. <laughs> what happened? I know you're already thinking it. So let's just go there. Okay, I'm comfortable enough in my manhood with the beard and the goatee to say that. Um, but uh, this is also the same day that my little brother um, Seth got baptized. She sent me that picture. She sent that. So, so let me just point out um, some, some epic do's and don'ts of baptism that come out of this picture. First epic don't do, white t-shirt. Now fortunately, I was jacked. So it didn't really matter, right? Because you come up out of that and you're like, boom, I'm 18. What's up? Baptism. I love the Lord, right? Um, that's one thing. The next thing is um, that I remember about this is the genius of the design. So what happened was is it was covered up and you didn't see the baptism all the time. Uh, but there is, as you can see, a little, a little stair behind there. Um, that's Pastor Ron Reynolds. I remember him. He was a pastor uh, there, the senior pastor when I was a, uh, a teenager. And we had a baptism Sunday. This is also um, the same altar that I got saved at, which is so, I mean, this is just my whole deal. My church had one Christian concert in its entire existence. And that's what I got saved at, a uh, Christian concert they had. Um, name of the band, Brian. Brian White and Justice, probably no one knows that name. Uh, but the, You went to school? Holy smokes. Do you know him? Oh my goodness. You need to see me after because I got saved at the concert. This is, Jesus is real, y'all. I mean, I've got the sticker from that concert. I went all out. I was like, give me the tape because that's how old this is. The CD, I've still got it. Dude, Nathan Swartz, you tell Brian the next time you tell he, it was his, he's, okay, I want to tell the story a little bit because somebody here actually knows him. If you ever talk to him again, he gets up there and he goes, hey, you know, God's a loving father if, and, and he loves you and he wants you to be saved. And it was like in this intermission, he was doing some riff and he was going, he's like, look, if you'd love um, for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and God to be your father, then why don't you just come forward and accept that? And so it was right here on the other side that I came forward and knelt. And then Brian came down and he prayed with me and I accepted Jesus my Lord and Savior. Totally freaking my mind out that you know him and that you're there. <laughs> we are on a big rabbit trail right now, but I don't even care. Because I just like, I will never see this guy or ever meet him ever again. But he was the instrument that helped me get saved and find Jesus Christ. 
Uh, this is um, Trenton Nazarene Church in Trenton, Ohio, which is a small town. Um, very small town. One stoplight. Uh, really, really pretty small. But I was 18 years old. This was briefly after I got my call to ministry. Um, another epic don't is forgot to hold my nose uh, when I did this and went back. So immediately just cleansing happened in the sinus cavity. <laughs> right? Because the pastor holds you down till your eyes get big. Then he pulls you up. So I was like, Ugh. so anyways, it was, um, it was a great celebratory experience. I still remember it. Uh, if I remember correctly, the pool's right. Oh yeah, this right here. Um, you guys remember those office mats that they would put down, those plastic ones that had the spikes of death underneath? So we were like, here's a good idea. So we laid those down and then there was a little carpet. But this was death when you came out of that baptism. And it was so slippery. And I remember coming out and almost falling um, and going, man, I'm glad I'm, I'm saved. And I just got saved because I almost died right there coming out of that deal um, for that. But it was just a great experience. So you'd come down and you'd go through. Ron Ron was an um, awesome dude and, and loved him as a pastor. And it was just, it was really just kind of a, a, a seminal uh, moment for me. So that's why I would say the one thing to you um, for the message that we have today. We should not withhold or withdraw baptism from anybody. And the scripture is going to help us to see that. The story that takes place. It, it is the evidence that, that God is good. It is the truth that Jesus saves and the Holy Spirit dwells in believers. So I remember sitting with Pastor Ron and he was drilling me all these questions. And I'm like a senior in high school going, I don't know these things. I just know that Jesus has saved my soul. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. Yes, that's true. I know that. But this, this is incredible. And he's like, look, it's baptism. You need to be baptized. So we just talked and we worked through that. He helped me to understand. It. My youth pastor, Denny Wilson, helped me um, to understand that, and, and, and we dove into that, and they're like, look, here's a deal, and here's the encouragement that takes place. It is something that is um, commanded from God's Word, and a huge, huge part of um, what we do as Christians. So let me give you some context to baptism beyond just my own life, because that's, that's not Scripture. That's just Scripture at work. But baptism is a witness, celebratory praise to God for salvation that has been received, so here's what happens. Uh, when someone gets baptized, other people should be there to celebrate it too. I mean, I firmly believe it. That's what we see in scriptures. Um, but it, it's also already taken place, that salvation that's there. It's also a source of everlasting joy. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm not 18. But I still look back at that picture and I smile and I reflect and I meet random people in Surf City, North Carolina that know the dude that helped lead me to Jesus Christ. It's crazy, man. It is so crazy what God can do. And when you think about baptism, it is something that is just, it's, it's glorious. So we're like, look, if, if God stops heaven and they celebrate and rejoice over one sinner that's saved, God has given us baptism so we can do that too. So we can have that praise and that celebration and cheer and go and encourage all that's on there. Um, for all my Greek lovers, get ready, buckle up. Um, baptism comes from the word baptizo which means to be fully immersed. Um, so, um, but they would use it in a more regular language. So if they had Krispy Kreme donuts in the time of Herod, then they would take that and dip that in, into their coffee. They'd go, I just baptized this donut. I just baptized it did. And that's what you do, right? You're playing in the pool with your friends and the older brother comes around and starts dunking you under the water. The regular term for that in the Greek language is I just baptized my brother. And then you'd have mom yelling, Stop baptizing your brother in the pool. He might drown, right? But what we see with us from the Old Testament and the, and the ritualistic purifications that take place, they were immersing themselves in that. In fact, they found on the outside of King Herod's wall where he built the temple in Jerusalem, a hundred purification pools. Because at the time of Jesus, when baptism was happening, in order to participate in any of the feasts, which we talked about weeks ago, or in order to enter the temple, you had to go and fully immerse yourself into water, into the Old Testament traditions to cleanse yourself before you came in. So there was this immersion in this pool that took place. And, then it, and that tracks back to the law of Moses and being clean. And when, when the Levites would, would put their hands on the scapegoat, which is where we got that term from, impute all of the sins of all the people, they'd say all of those. Then they'd take this, the, the um, goat out into the desert. Then the law says that that, Levi, that priest had to go and wash himself and cleanse him of, as symbolically of all the filth of that sin that he had just said and he had just done. So what you're seeing here in this 
uh, baptism is a continuation of the Old Testament into the New. Jesus sort of bringing that act in. In fact, let's look at a passage um, where it actually takes place and how it begins um, to engage. So Acts chapter 10, uh, verse 44 um, through 48. Uh, we're just going to read these together, then we'll unpack this a little bit so we can best um, understand it. This is in the section where the Holy Spirit falls on Gentiles. So while Peter had gone to uh, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. There's a lot of people there, the servants, all those for Cornelius. And the believers from among the circumcised who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For them, for them, they, they were hearing him speaking in tongues and extolling God. And Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked him to remain for some days. So what's taking place here first? So first of all, they're hearing the word, right? They're, they're hearing the gospel message of Jesus. Jesus Christ, you read the rest of chapter 10, and it's incredible how God lines that up. But they're saved first. So they hear the word, they respond to the word, and as they're hearing it and responding it, then the Holy Spirit comes and dwells. Very similar, well, very, very similar to Jesus' experience when he was baptized. So they hear these words, they begin to believe, and then in verse 45, it talks about how the circumcised who had came with Peter, right? Because they're bringing other people with them. Peter's got an other, other crowd out there. They're experiencing this. They're celebrating it, and they were amazed. As in amazed in the term of rejoicing. Like, wow, this is incredible. This is fantastic. The Holy Spirit's falling on them like it does on us. Because it says right there, it was a gift of the Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Which, unless you're here and you're Jewish, then, then you're Gentile. So the Holy Spirit's coming out, which is just a major, incredible um, loving invasion of God and Jesus into the life of world history. To say that, that I am truly here for everyone. That they all be able to begin and they all be able to receive. So look at all this stuff that's lining up, right? The gift of the Holy Spirit is now dwelling in them. They begin to speak in tongues and languages um, that they understand is different. Um, they're extolling and proclaiming God. So then Peter declares and he comes to this part and he's like, look, here's the deal. Can anyone withhold baptism from these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Which was a problem. That's what was happening there. They were withholding um, ritualistic rites from the Gentiles. But, but more than that, they were just saying these people aren't ready. They're not good enough. They're not right enough. They're not done enough to be baptized, um, to follow along and in that. And in the book of Acts, we really see baptism in the form in which we understand it now. The importance and the pressure uh, of it and, and the, really the immediacy. That's what you find. You find a lot of immediacy. So someone gets saved is a ASAP. They, man, they want to get as soon as possible to be baptized. Now, let me make, make this um, very clear. Well, let me say this. Let me just ask the question that's on the notes so type A people stop sweating. Um, what is baptism? And here's how I would just define it. Baptism is an outward expression of your already inner faith in Jesus Christ. You wouldn't put baptism in front of salvation. It comes after. Now how that happens and how quickly that does, hopefully it's, it's sooner rather than later. But baptism, as it's said here, and you see it's an expression of the already in faith. Even in the Old Testament, people who immerse themselves for purification before they entered the temple or participate in the feast were already believers. Like you wouldn't participate in the feast. You wouldn't go to the temple to worship unless um, you were in the faith of Judaism. You just, you wouldn't. And the same is true for us. Baptism is an outward expression of your already inner faith in Jesus Christ. It's that celebration to say that I believe and he saved my soul. So you get the message of, of John the Baptist. You get the message of Jesus. R repent and, ba and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Publicly show that. Turn from your sin towards Jesus as Lord and Savior because sin is deadly and harmful. And you're not only going to pay. It's not like live incredible life now and then just pay for it when you die. No, people pay for it now when they don't follow Jesus Christ. They have no one to turn to for strength. No one to turn to for healing. No one to turn to for wisdom and guidance and direction. All of those things are left out when you're not a Christian. So Jesus is like, look, you must seek forgiveness and celebrate it publicly. It's what we say um, when I baptize people. I know when we're doing it on the beach and we're out there just fighting the waves and, and you can't really hear what it's doing. But I kind of love that because I, I think when you get baptized in the ocean, you find out real quick if someone really loves Jesus. I mean, you really do. Those waves are coming. Sometimes I whisper the word shark just to make sure that they're okay. 
And then they're like, oh, right? And you do it. And, we, and, and you go and you bring him down. And, and, and part of that saying that we do is you, you are dead to sin. Boom, put him in. And alive in Christ. Pete says he just got baptized at the beach this summer. Uh, I know. That's right. That's what's called. See, when you, when, you're, when you go to grad school, they teach you tricks like that to burn it in people's memory and emotions. So that's what we do. So if you... Uh, yeah, that's right. Look, epic move. When you get baptized, close your mouth. <laughs> Pete just testified. So yeah, there you go. You've been trained. The next time you baptize someone, hold the nose, close the mouth. Yeah, it'll get you. It'll get you. Yeah, and if Nathan's doing it, make sure you're saved. Right? Make sure you're safe. So, I've not lost anybody yet, but hey, who knows? Who knows? Right? So, when you, when you, when you talk about that, that, that's how we understand. We, it's, uh, in theology terms, it's, it's the believer's baptism. That's what we believe. And, and we encourage people to do it as immediately as possible, that they would engage just like Peter says here. I, I really believe these words to be true. He commanded them to be baptized. And as much as possible, every Christian should be baptized. We see in Matthew chapter 3, 15 and 16, right? Jesus comes to John the Baptist. is like, I want you to baptize me. Which I, I probably would have had the exact same response as John did. What? I need to be baptized by you. But what did he say? In order to fulfill all righteousness, we must do this. And then John's like, okay. Because you don't argue with Jesus. It never turns out well. So then he baptizes him and he goes to do that. There are some instances. This is one of the reasons that I believe in a believer's baptism and I, and I believe wholeheartedly in the, what, what the Bible has to say is um, because there were people who were saved that weren't baptized that went to heaven. Probably the best, one of the best examples is a thief on the cross. Right? The thief on the cross who Jesus turned to him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. Now they didn't unnail that guy, baptize him, renail him, and then he died. But he had had that conversion. He had had that experience. But what you do see is for all that are able to be baptized, they are. Remember when Philip is walking along um, side. I was just talking to Tim about this on Thursday night. When Philip was walking alongside um, the guy that was, that was reading the scroll of Isaiah. And then he's like, why shouldn't I be baptized? Then he looks and goes, look, there's water. Let's do this right now. So he jumps out of the thing. Philip baptizes him. As he's baptizing him, Philip's taken away teleported, transported, whatever you want to call it, by God to another place. And the dude just immediately does it. And that's what you're finding in scripture. For those who become Christian to seek baptism, um, really as soon as you can, a, 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 as quickly as you can to, to portray that, to put that out. Um, because not only is that what Peter commands it, but Peter, remember, got it from who? He got it from Jesus. Matthew 28, 19. You guys remember the Great Commission? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey um, everything that I have commanded you. You know, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So Peter's just commanding what Jesus told him to command. It, it's a commandment, right? Uh, I love what they say. It's not the great suggestion. Like, hey, here's a good idea. No, God's like, this is what we're doing. This is what you need to do. So baptism's huge. It's vital. It's so very important that he does it. That's in Matthew 20 and 19. You, you can look at that for yourself. That Jesus is like, look, people need to express that publicly. And it always goes well. Every time we do it on the beach, whenever we do it in random places where there are people around, they just start to gather, Right? They just start wondering. I, I love it when we do those and we can get out the beach and do that because there's so many people there who don't love Jesus. They're drinking their special beverages and their little cooler caddies and they're like, what's happening? Why does this guy keep pushing people under the water? And they come out so excited and they're celebrating and, and it starts to gather a crowd. We've had people who have been moved spontaneously at the sunrise services that we do um, with the gathering where they have just been like, I want to be baptized. So standing there in your jeans and your shirt, you just go and you baptize someone right there at the, the dawn of Easter Sunday where they go to be baptized. So we, we do and we follow scripture as close as we can, which says as much as it is possible is it able to do for you that you should seek to be baptized in a way to do it. And we just follow the literal translation of that word, which is full immersion, and that's why we do it. There are those who, who sprinkle. There are those who pour. Um, we really just encourage because we have the ability to do that because of where we live and how close we are to the coast. We just fully immerse people in it. 
and try to follow the scriptures as much as possible as God says to do after someone's saved, after they want to express their already inner faith. And we work through that and talk through that and we've discussed those. So um, what is so great about baptism? I mean, really, what's so great about it? It's a celebration of, a, of God because Jesus has saved someone by grace through faith. But it's also a, a mile marker, right? I mean, Pete already testified to it. I will never forget that. The saltiness of the water, right? I will never forget. I, I'll never forget the baptisms that I did where the heater broke in the baptistry of that church. And it was the Arctic water that was churning in there. Just burns you. It's so cold. But one of the things that makes baptism so great is the public celebration of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done. That's really what's glorified in that. Is that Christ has saved your soul and my soul? He saved all of our souls. He desires for our souls to be saved if we're not. So people cheer for strangers. They rejoice for, for those that they don't know because God has done something so good, he's transformed them. Literally, the old is gone and the new is come and we can watch that born again symbolized rebirth right before our eyes. And it also confirms, hey, other things. We're not going to hell because Jesus has saved our soul. When we, he hears the prayers of the righteous person, they avail much. When we don't know what to do, he'll be able to tell us when we're, we're, we want to grow deeper and know what love more is. When we want to know who we should date and who we should marry and what job to take and how to promote and how to parent our kids or unparent our kids or grandparent our kids or live in this life stage we are, we can turn to Christ who is with us always to the very end of the age and we know that we can do that because it's sealed. Plus, places of remembrance are just, they're, they're memorials of perspective gathering. I mean, there are so many stories that came flooding back when we looked at that picture of my baptism. Just things I could tell where I fell on my face and the Lord just helped me. And then just all those things it took and all those things I need to learn and so much more that I didn't. But I can tell you what, that 18-year-old dude had no idea how deep the well of God's love was for him. It is unreal. And if I could do anything, I would go back and tell him to do it sooner. Don't wait. Because it's just, it's magnificent. And it, it connects us. It binds us all. One of the things, one of the questions we're going to do in, in the Thursday Night Excuse House, we're going to sit around the table while we're reading and go, hey, what do you remember about your baptism? If you guys want to bring pictures, that's cool. But we're just going to share those moments and those stories um, that bind us together. Do you remember that? We read Jesus and it draws us into. So, and, and not only that, but we talked about the Holy Spirit last week and his good work, but it's just confirmation that the Holy Spirit lives and dwells and helps in among us. I mean, it just confirms that, that God moved in. And it just reminds you, too, also years later, as you move decades beyond your baptism moment and date, and the devil tries to tell you a bunch of stuff, you could go, you know what? I'm saved by grace through faith. I am Christ and he is mine. And I may drift, I may linger too long in dark places, but Christ is there. I may want to stand on the mountaintops and beard, build tabernacles for the Lord. And he says, no, go down, because that's where the ministry is. But still I remember the moment of my salvation and the point of baptism, because there are seminal moments there. There are no other moments that are like that in all of our history, in all of our time. So we work and we move on. We know we exist to bring God glory and make disciples. This is one way to do it. I mean, I, I have my kids there. And I take my kids to see it. My kids aren't saved yet. They've not been baptized yet. But I take them to see and experience it. And they, they love it. And they're all over in the sand. And they play in the water and the ocean. But, but it, it's a family experience. We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate anniversaries. What happens when you miss anniversaries? And you miss celebrations? Bad things happen, right? But what happens you remember? Man, we rejoice together in that. So based on this message, what, what can we do to become more like Jesus Christ? So we know the truth of baptism. We celebrate the believer's baptism. We know you're dead to sin but alive in Christ because of it. Um, we know that there are so many more great things about baptism than what we have even be able to cover here. But we also know the one thing that we should not withhold or withdraw people from it. Let's just talk about our worship our worship for a second. When we're looking at this, um, this one's easy. This is a no-brainer to put down. Be baptized. Look, I love you. 
And I hope you wore your steel toe boots because I'm going to step on your toes a little bit. If you're sitting here today and you're a Christian and you've never been baptized, then you need to, more than need, have to do it. It's commanded by Christ himself and passed down through all of the ages of human history. Talk to any of the New Testament people, they would say that's true. Be baptized. I would say that to all of you watching online as well. Get to the, your, your local home church. Go there and say, look, I need to be baptized. I've never done it. If you're a Christian, you need to. You should. It's, it, it is a part of the faith. It's commanded, and we are called to do that. And if you're not saved, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've not confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead so that you might be saved because with your mouth that you confess in your heart that you believe then I would say this when that moment comes for you to be saved which is could be right now or in the next few minutes then immediately find a place where you can go and be baptized just do it just wherever you can find that and talk to who, at that moment and go where do we do this how do we make this happen so as part of your worship, I would do that. If you're already baptized and you're like, shoo, I'm glad I'm already baptized. I would just say as part of your worship, just remember. I mean, it's not going to hurt. I don't know. Maybe you call your mom and be like, hey, you got any pictures, secret pictures of me being baptized? Just remember that and rejoice in that. Or share that with others because it's, it's, it's huge. Now, when we're out of community, what can we do? Now, when you're out of community, no matter who they are, invite others to attend baptism with you, man. I mean, just, just cast the net wide. Um, celebrate with others um, when someone gets baptized. Because you guys know when we do beach baptisms, we always hijack the gathering's parking lot. <laughs> That's what I got to say. Right? Oh, I'm sorry. You can't park here. For baptism... Sorry, Pastor Bobby. What are you going to do about that? So we always say, so I tell you, hi, Jack, you park over there. Then we walk over. And as we're walking over and people are like, hey, well, what are you doing? I'm like, you know, what are you doing here? And they're like, oh, we're here for vacation. I'm here for baptism. Come on over. Come on over. Or let's find a place where people are. So some of you guys will come in and you'll gather in sort of a, a low populated area. And I'll just sort of shift like 10 yards to where there are more people. But you invite others and you celebrate with others when someone gets baptized. I mean, I've been baptized. Like, people are celebrating. I'm like, wow, you're celebrating. And they're like, no, that person didn't drown. That's why I'm celebrating. Yay, they didn't drown. Wee. But I would encourage you to um, invite others. Typically around here, you know when they're going to happen. Not all the time. But you, you tend to know at least the summer one when we do the summer baptism. It's just coming. And, and it's a great way to invite people. You know, let's come to the beach and do that. And we'll bring sunscreen or whatever we need to do or blankets and snuggies if it's cold and uh, we'll do that too so invite others to attend baptism with you it's a it's a great way because it is a celebration here's a good way to serve um, others serve God um, be ready as a Christian to baptize um, when someone wants to be baptized don't wait do it ASAP that's what we see here right and you might be thinking ah but Peter but it, it really the, the the whole moniker for that is are you a Christian and here's what I'd say to you if you're with someone and, and you're talking to them about Jesus and they get saved in that moment because Jesus does a good work, then I would say to you, and I would encourage them strongly, I would lean heavily, I would auto lock the car doors and the house doors so they can't get out and go, look, we need to handle this baptism deal. And just go and do it. Get out there and baptize them. Don't worry about calling me or somebody else other than to come and be a part. I'm not saying that. But don't withhold or withdraw baptism because you don't think you have the right person there. If you're a Christian and you've been baptized, you've been saved by grace, I would say, just like Philip did, don't wait. Because if you're saved, you're a disciple. If you're saved, you're a child of God and you can do that. Other people may believe differently about that, but this is the thing about this. About what makes baptism awesome? Because you're there? No. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's doing all the work. God's done all the work. Christ's done all the work. You're just the mechanism for that. So I just encourage you um, to not put that off because you never know. You never know what might happen. So I'm just, I guess the overarching with that is when it comes to people who act as, I just want to do it as, as soon as I can to that, um, to the point of their salvation as that works. And then multiplication um, kind of rolls out of that, which is um, encourage others to be saved and baptized um, to, to great commission. Go and make disciples, baptizing them. So when you find yourself in the midst of someone, you encourage them to be saved. You encourage them to be baptized. You encourage because not only just because Jesus commanded, because there's just such a celebratory moment in the midst of all of that. So I would encourage you to encourage others to be saved, right? Um, salvation is a, is a free gift of grace through no works of their own. It's, it's so no one can boast. It's freely given. It's Joel 2.32. Just call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. 
So you can offer that freely. And then when they do that, celebrate that. And sure, on your way to wherever that's happening or as that took place, go, hey, give me 10 minutes. I'm going to text some people. See if we can get them here to kind of help do that. So you can have that make happen and have that take place. And just encourage them in that midst to go in there. Because the glory and honor isn't for you. The glory and honor is for God to celebrate what he has done, the goodness that he is. So how do we give God praise and credit? We baptize people after they're saved. That's sort of believe. So let me remind you of the one thing as a good kind of um, segue here. Um, we should not withhold or withdraw um, from baptism. So when we say withhold, we should give people the opportunities as, as much as possible um, to be able to do it. I mean, we've got a body of water right here. And anyone who gets baptized in that's going to love Jesus, because I can tell you, those turtles in there are monstrous. One came out and I was like, you are left over from Noah's Ark. That is humongous. <laughs> I will step across this on there. But you just, you take those advantages, just like Philip, and I love that, but, but you also don't withdraw from it. And when I say withdraw, you, you might be a Christian here watching a liner, or maybe you find this video I mean, years from now, if the Lord tarries, and you're, for some reason you've just never been baptized, I would say, don't wait. The tough challenge is the salvation part, only in as much as you publicly coming forward and just saying, I'm ready to be saved. Jesus, forgive me of my sins and admitting you need him and you're wrong and you're wretched and allowing him to transform you into his child of God. But after that, it's just celebratory. It's celebratory. Baptism is meant to be enjoyed in love. So I would say to you to not withdraw. If you're here today and you're like, I've never been baptized. I've never, never done that, never been immersed. And I would say, I would get with me after and we will handle that as quickly as we can. And then if you are someone's baptized, just remember and encourage others. So